We ended last time talking about the narrative conception of the self. We were testing the narrative conception of the self and the idea of obligations of solidarity or membership that did not flow from consent, that claimed us for reasons unrelated to a contract or an agreement or a choice we may have made. And we were debating among ourselves whether there are any obligations of this kind or whether all apparent obligations of solidarity and membership can be translated into consent or reciprocity or a universal duty that we owe persons qua persons. And then there were those who defended the idea of loyalty and of patriotism. So the idea of loyalty and of solidarity and of membership gathered a certain kind of intuitive moral force in our discussion. And then, as we concluded, we considered what seems to be a pretty powerful counterexample to that idea. Namely, the film of those southern segregationists in the 1950s, and they talked all about their traditions, their history, the way in which their identities were bound up with their life history. Do you remember that? And what flowed from that history, from that narrative sense of identity for those southern segregationists? They said, we have to defend our way of life. Is this a fatal or a decisive objection to the idea of the narrative conception of the self? That's the question we were left with. What I would like to do today is to advance an argument and see what you make of it. And let me tell you what that argument is. I would like to defend the narrative conception of the person as against the voluntarist conception. I would like to defend the idea that there are obligations of solidarity or membership. Then, I want to suggest that there being such obligations lends force to the idea, when we turn to justice, that arguments about justice can't be detached, cannot be detached after all, from questions of the good. But I want to distinguish two different ways in which justice might be tied to the good and argue for one of them. Now, the voluntarist conception of the person of Kant and Rawls we saw was powerful and liberating. A further appeal is its universal aspiration. The idea of treating persons as persons without prejudice, without discrimination. And I think that's what led some among us to argue that, okay, maybe there are obligations of membership, but they are always subordinate. They must always be subordinate to the duties that we have to human beings as such, the universal duties. But is that right? If our encompassing loyalty should always take precedence over more particular ones, then the distinction between friends and strangers should ideally be overcome. Our special concern for the welfare of friends would be a kind of prejudice, a measure of our distance from universal human concern. But if you look closely at that idea, what kind of a moral universe, what kind of moral imagination would that lead you to? The Enlightenment philosopher Montesquieu gives perhaps the most powerful and I think the ultimately the most honest account of where this relentless universalizing tendency leads the moral imagination. Here's how Montesquieu put it. He said, a truly virtuous man would come to the aid of the most distant stranger as quickly as to his own friend. And then he adds, listen to this, if men were perfectly virtuous, 
they wouldn't have friends. But it's difficult to imagine a world in which persons were so virtuous that they had no friends, only a universal disposition to friendliness. The problem isn't simply that such a world would be difficult to bring about, that it's unrealistic. The deeper problem is that such a world would be difficult to recognize as a human world. The love of humanity is a noble sentiment, but most of the time we live our lives by smaller solidarities. This may reflect certain limits to the bounds of moral sympathy, but more important, it reflects the fact that we learn to love humanity, not in general, but through its particular expressions. So these are some considerations. They're not knockdown arguments, but moral philosophy can't offer knockdown arguments, but considerations of the kinds that we've been discussing and arguing about all along. Well, suppose that's right. One way of assessing whether this picture of the person and of obligation is right is to see what are its consequences for justice. And here's where it confronts a serious problem. And here we go back to our southern segregationists. They felt the weight of history. Do we admire their character, these segregationists who wanted to preserve their way of life? Are we committed to saying, if we accept the idea of solidarity membership, are we committed to saying that justice is tied to the good in the sense that justice means whatever a particular community or tradition says it means? including those southern segregationists. Here it's important to distinguish two different ways in which justice can be tied to the good. One is a relativist way. That's the way that says to think about rights, to think about justice, look to the values that happen to prevail in any given community at any given time. Don't judge them by some outside standard, but instead conceive justice as a matter of being faithful to the shared understandings of a particular tradition. But there's a problem with this way of tying justice to the good. The problem is that it makes justice wholly conventional, a product of circumstance, and this deprives justice of its critical character. But there is a second way in which justice can be tied with or bound up with the good. On this second non-relativist way of linking justice with conceptions of the good, principles of justice depend for their justification not on the values that happen to prevail at any given moment in a certain place, but instead on the moral worth or the intrinsic good of the ends rights serve. On this non-relativist view, the case for recognizing a right depends on showing that it honors or advances some important human good. This second way of tying justice to the good is not, strictly speaking, communitarian, if by communitarian you mean just giving over to a particular community the definition of justice. Now what I would like to suggest that of these two different ways of linking justice to the good, the first is insufficient because the first leaves justice the creature of convention. It doesn't give us enough moral resources to respond to those southern segregationists who invoke their way of life, their traditions, their way of doing things. But if justice is bound up with the good in a non-relativist way, there's a big challenge, a big question to answer. How can we reason about the good? What about the fact that people hold different conceptions of the good, different ideas about the purposes of key social institutions, different ideas 
about what social goods and human goods are worthy of honor and recognition. We live in a pluralist society. People disagree about the good. That's one of the incentives to try to find principles of justice and rights that don't depend on any particular ends or purposes or goods. So is there a way to reason about the good? Before addressing that question, I want to address a slightly easier question. Is it necessary, is it unavoidable when arguing about justice to argue about the good? And my answer to that question is yes, it's unavoidable, it's necessary. So for the remainder of today, I want to take up, I want to try to advance that claim that reasoning about the good, about purposes and ends is an unavoidable feature of arguing about justice. It's necessary. Let me see if I can establish that. And for that, I'd like for us to begin a discussion of same-sex marriage. Now, same-sex marriage draws on, implicates deeply contested and controversial ideas morally and religiously. And so there's a powerful incentive to embrace a conception of justice or of rights that doesn't require the society as a whole to pass judgment one way or another on those hotly contested moral and religious questions about the moral permissibility of homosexuality, about the proper ends of marriage as a social institution, so clearly, if there's an incentive to resolve this question, to define people's rights in a way that doesn't require the society as a whole to sort out those moral and religious disputes, that would be very attractive. So what I would like to do now is to see, using the same-sex marriage case, whether it's possible to detach one's views about the moral permissibility of homosexuality and about the purpose, the end of marriage, to detach those questions from the question of whether the state should recognize same-sex marriage or not. So let's begin. I would like to begin by hearing the arguments of those who believe that there should be no same-sex marriage, but that the state should only recognize marriage between a man and a woman. Do I have volunteers? I had two that were Two people I asked, people who had voiced their views already on the Justice blog, Mark Luff and Ryan McCaffrey. Where are you? Okay, uh, Mark, and where's Ryan? All right, let's go first to Mark. I have sort of a teleological understanding of um, the purpose of sex and the purpose of marriage. And I think that for people like myself who are a Christian and also a Catholic, the purpose of sex is one, for its procreative um, uses, and two, for a unifying purpose between a man and a woman within the, within the institution of marriage. You have a certain conception of the purpose or the telos yeah. of human sexuality, which is bound up with procreation. Right as well as union. Yeah. And the essence of marriage, the purpose of marriage as a social institution is to give expression to that telos and to honor that purpose, namely the procreative purpose of marriage. Is that a fair summary of your view? Yeah. Where is Ryan? Go ahead. Do you agree more or less with Mark's reasons? Yes, I agree. Um, uh, I think that uh, the ideal of marriage is involves procreation, and it's fine that you know homosexuals would go off and um, and and cohabitate with each other, but that it, the government doesn't have a responsibility to encourage that. All right, so the government should not encourage homosexual behavior by conferring the recognition of marriage. Yeah, it would be wrong to outlaw it, but encouraging it is not necessary. Who has a reply? Yes. Hannah? 
I'd just like to ask a question to Mark. Um, <clears throat> let's say you got married to a woman, you did not have sex with her before marriage, and then when you became married, it became evident that you were an infertile couple. Do you think that it should be illegal for you to engage in sex if, you, if children will not result from that act? Yeah, I, I think that it is moral, and that's why I gave the, the twofold purpose. So like a woman, say, I think older couples can get married, Someone, a woman who's beyond, um, who's already had menopause, and who can't have a child, because I think that sex has these, it has purposes beyond procreation. I hate to be uncouth, but have you ever engaged in masturbation? <laughs> well, <right>. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, it, see, you don't have to answer that. You can, well, yeah, I think, I, 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 all right. Just a minute. No. Why, make your, make no, your I, I'd argument. like to respond to that. No, I think, wait, look, we've, we've done pretty well over a whole semester, and we're doing pretty well now, dealing with questions that most people think can't even be discussed in a university setting. And Hannah, you got, you have a powerful point. Make that point as a general argument rather okay. than. <laughs> rather than as an interrogative. Okay. But make the point. What's the, what's the principle that you're appealing? Okay. What's the argument you have in mind? All right, well, biblically... Put it in the third person, yeah. okay. rather, than, okay. rather, than, <laughs> rather than in the okay, second sure. person. Make, make the argument, go okay. ahead. Okay, biblically, masturbation or onanism is not permissible because it's um, you know, spilling your seed on the earth when it's not going to result in the birth of a child. But what I'm saying is, you know, you're saying that sex, you know, there's something wrong with sex if it doesn't produce children or reinforce uh, the marriage bond. Right. But then how can you say that there's something wrong, that, you know, masturbation is permissible if masturbation obviously is not going to, you know, create a child? Yeah, I think marriage is society's way to create this separate institution where they say, this is what we hold as a virtue. Yes, every day we fall short. And people fall short in so many different other ways. But I think that if you personally fall short in some moral sphere, as we all do, that doesn't take the right of you to argue. All right. I want you, you to stay there. I want to bring in some other voices, and we'll continue. Stay there if you would. Go ahead. I think that the response to the masturbation... Wait, tell us your... My name's Steve. Steve, go ahead. All right. Um, the response to the masturbation issue is uh, it's not something that's permissible. I don't think anyone will argue that, that homosexual sex is impermissible. It's just that society has no place in letting you marry yourself if masturbation is something that you do. Well, all right, Hannah. <laughs> all right, Steve has drawn... All right, that's a good argument. Steve has drawn our attention to the fact that there are two issues here. One of them is the moral permissibility of various practices. Mm -hmm. The other is the fit between certain practices, whatever their moral permissibility, with the honor or recognition that the state should accord in allowing marriage. So Steve has a pretty good okay. counter-argument. What do you say to Steve? Um, well, I think that it's clear that human sexuality is something that is you know, inherent in, I believe, most people. And it's not something you can avoid. And masturbation, I mean, yeah, you can't marry yourself, but I don't think that takes away from the fact that, you know, homosexuals are people too. And I just, I can't, I can't understand why they wouldn't be able to marry each other. If you want to marry yourself, I mean, I, I don't know if you can legally do that. <laughs> That's fine, but I don't wait, think... Wait, 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 wait. Now, here we're deciding, we're, here we're deliberating as if legislators what the law should be. Mm -hmm. okay. So you said, Steve, that's fine. Does that mean as a legislator you would vote for a law of marriage that would be so broad <laughs> that it would let people marry themselves? Well, I mean, that, that's really beyond the pale of like anything that would really happen, but I don't think but that... But in principle. Yeah, in principle. Yes. Yeah, sure. I mean, if Steve wants to marry himself, I'm not going to stop him. Like, I, I think <laughs> and you would confer uh, state recognition on that solo marriage. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and while we're at it, what about uh, consensual polygamous marriages? 
I, I actually think that if the male and the female are, like, if the wives and the man and the husband or the husbands and the wife are consenting, it should be permissible. Who else? There, I know there are a lot of people who, yes, okay, down here. Stand up and tell us your name. Uh, Victoria. Victoria. So we're talking about the theological reasoning here for marriage, but I think the problem is that we're talking about it within the Catholic viewpoint, whereas the theological and the point to marriage for another religion or someone who's an atheist could be completely different. And the government doesn't have a right to impose the theological reasoning for Catholicism on everyone in the state, which is what my problem is with not allowing same-sex marriage. Because, I mean, your beliefs are your beliefs, and that's fine. But civil union is not marriage within the Catholic Church. And the state has a right to recognize a civil union between whoever it wants, but it does not have a right to impose the beliefs of a certain minority or majority or whoever it is based on a religion within our state. All right, Victoria, good. A question. Do you think the state should recognize same-sex marriage or just same-sex civil unions as something short of marriage? Well, I think that the state doesn't have a right to recognize it as marriage within a church because that is not their place. But whereas civil union, I see civil union as essentially the same thing except not under a uh -huh. religion. And the state has a right to recognize a civil union. All right, so Victoria's argument is that the state should not try to decide the question of what the telos of marriage is. That's only something that religious communities can decide. Um, who else? Um, my point is, I don't see why uh, we feel like state should recognize marriages at all. Uh, so I'm like one of these 70 people who voted state should not ma recognize any marriages because I believe it is, like, it is a union between a male and a female or two males or two females. But there is no reason to like ask state to give permission to me to unite myself. And some might say that like, if state recognizes these marriages, it will help children, it will have a binding effect, but in reality, I don't think it actually has a binding effect. All right, tell us your name. Cezanne. So, uh, Victoria and Cezanne's comments differ from earlier parts of the conversation. They say the state shouldn't be in the business of honoring or recognizing or affirming any particular telos or purpose of marriage or of human sexuality. And Cezanne is among those who says, therefore, maybe the state should get out of the business of recognizing marriage at all. Here's the question. Unless you adopt Cezanne's position, no state recognition of any kind of marriage, is it possible to choose between, uh, to decide the question of same-sex marriage without taking a stand on the moral and religious controversy over the proper telos of marriage. Thank you very much to all of you who have participated. We'll pick this up next time. You did a great job.